Assalamu alaikum everyone. Now today I'm going to be refuting this video by Paperboy. Now I'm not doing it because he's got a lot of views or because he's got a strong case. I'm doing it for a few reasons. One is that he's approached this uh, Trinity Tawheed debate in a different way. Now the spin he put on it is to say that the concept of a Trinity is not alien to the Jews. It's not something that they have rejected throughout their history. It's something that they've accepted. And that's quite interesting. So, uh, uh, yeah, why, why not? Let's, uh, let's attack that head on. The other reason um, is that he has claimed to have done some serious scholarship. No, not only that, he's so confident in his research that he's challenged us to expose him. So, heck yeah, I'm going to expose him. And the third reason is that the people who have watched this video have been convinced. And they've been convinced because he presented it well. I'll give him that. He's presented it very well. Um, but when you take into account that he's done 36, 136 slides in just over 110 minutes, which averages around 48 seconds a slide, um, you can't say that that is scholarship, you know? So I'm going to address everything that he's presented. Now, not because I need to. Uh, I'm choosing to so that he doesn't come back and say, well, he couldn't address this or that. Uh, and to show the Christians and others who have watched this clip, uh, this video, just because someone puts something in front of your screen and says it's a source and comes to a conclusion means he's right about it. So um, considering it is long, let's get on with it. Now, in John 1, we see, in the beginning was the word... Whoa, 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 whoa. Stop there. John 1? What's John 1 got to do with anything? All right, yeah, okay, I get you're going to try and prove that the word is uh, something that Jews understood before, but that's not what you're trying to display. Have you forgotten the title of your video? It's called The Trinity is a Jewish Concept. Not the word is a Jewish concept. So we're already getting off on, on the wrong foot. Um, this is what he's supposed to be presenting, the Anathasian Creed, because this is what he believes, this is what he is claiming that is true, therefore this is what he should be proving that is that stems from Jewish tradition, not the word, but we'll get, it, we'll get into that later on. Um, however, I do like what he does next, and that is set a criteria for understanding the Bible, which is great. A person does need to comprehend the theology and the literacy of the Bible and criticize its history to see if it is true or not. But will Paperboy stick to this criteria? Will he assess it in a way that allows the Bible to speak for itself and allow the history to speak for itself rather than superimposing his own ideas of it? We shall see. So I'll start off throwing this question to people. In Psalms 33, 6, it says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. So my question to you is, is this figuratively speaking, or is this speaking about the real presence? And we'll kind of come back later on to look at this. Okay, well, before we move on to the main presentation, where he gives the evidence and everything, yeah, all of this is a prelude. Uh, this is his introduction, um, but he's not finished yet. He's got one more thing to show us, and that is this. Now, I have a few issues with this. The first is from Augustine, which I'll get to at the end of my refutation, um, and, and we'll see why. The second is with the principle of accommodation. Now, it's not the principle itself that I disagree with, because I understand that God uses language to accommodate our understanding, our limited understanding. It's this part that I disagree with. Now, why do I say that? It's because why would God use language to personify himself when the Jews have never anthropomorphized him? Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is because Paperboy gives the example of regret, which is a poor example. I mean, in order for someone to regret, you have to have a lack of foreknowledge, 
you have to have a lack of wisdom in order to make a decision that you will come to regret later on. So, you know, despite this being a prelude to his evidence trail, it's getting off to a really bad start, but at least we get into it now. So let's go. So this all begins now, our historical uh, journey from the two powers in heaven. And now 25 years ago, rabbinical scholar Alan Siegel produced what is still a major work on the idea of two powers in heaven in Jewish thought. Siegel once argued that the two powers idea was not deemed heretical in Jewish theology until the second century CE. Wait, whoa, whoa, give me a second. Okay, well, two powers in heaven. Let's have a look. Hello. Wait, wait. Huh. You guys saw what I just saw, right? It's a copy and paste job and not even from the book. What did he say earlier? So this all begins now, our historical uh, journey from the two powers in heaven. Yeah, that's what I thought he said. Now, it's a shame he didn't reference anything from the book, uh, considering that this is the start of his historical journey, uh, especially when he claims to have done some serious scholarship. Now, even though he moves right on, I want to stop and show you why he shouldn't have referenced this book at all. Now, on page 60, it says, The heavenly enthronement text, whose interpretation separated orthodoxy from heresy in passage 1, which is on page 33 of this book and speaks about the conflicting appearances of God uh, in relation to Daniel 7, are suggestive of Merkapur mysticism and its antecedents. As we have seen, this controversial phenomenon in Jewish history has been implicated from the beginning of research on Jewish Gnosticism. Now, Haggai 15a is referenced on this uh, page and I highlighted it for a reason, we'll get to that. However, Chapter 5, which is called The Midrashic Warnings Against the Two Powers, speaks of the one God being able to do multiple things, which is why I is repeated twice and not due to multiple persons. Now, the book constantly talks of heretics that take scripture to mean more than one, when in fact it doesn't. Now, chapters 8 through 10 speak about this thoroughly, and even Gabriel was thought to be one of the Yahwehs of heretical thought. Now I chose to reference Haggai 15a because it was brought up in other works that I have read. Uh, one is a book by Peter Schaeffer called The Origins of Jewish Mysticism, and it also came up in the Jewish Encyclopedia. And in the Jewish Encyclopedia it says this, Name of an angel found only in Jewish literature. Elisha, seeing this angel in the heavens, believed there were two powers or divinities. When God wept over the, over the destruction of the temple, Metatron, fell on his face and said, I will weep, but weep not thou. God answered and said, If thou wilt not suffer me to weep, I will go whither thou canst not come, and there I will lament. Now Metatron bears the Tetragrammaton for Exodus 23-21, where he says, My name is in him. Yet he may not be worshipped, for the same passage says, Exchange me not for him. And this is a dialogue between a heretic and a Babylonian, Babylonian teacher in the Sanhedrin 38b. And on page 70 we read, This is not intended to say that the pericope, which has been described as characteristic of the 3rd century, at the earliest must be speaking about 1st century Christianity. There are some obvious differences between the two uses of Exodus 23.20. I only maintain that arguments like those which we find opposed by the rabbis in the 3rd century and later were already present in heretical writings of the first century as represented by Christians. Now, I reference page 67 also, which talks about Metatron and in relation to Daniel 7.9, because when we read Daniel 7.9, it says the Ancient of Days. Now, if anyone has read Daniel Boyerin, uh, Boyerin's work on the divine polymorph, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, but 
uh, before I give my overview, I do want to recommend buying these books, uh, uh, reading these works, you know, by Alan Siegel, by Daniel Boyrin, and by Peter Schaefer. Amazing works. Gives a good, a really, really good um, idea of what the Jewish history is like. So to sum up, in Haggadah 15a, the angel Metatron is called Yahweh in Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 through 21. The heavenly enthronement text of Daniel 7 9 refers to Metatron as an ancient of days. Gabriel is called Yahweh. And the kicker these were present in heretical writings of the first century as represented by Christians. So, what writings were represented by Christians in the first century? Well, the New Testament. Now, I hear the cries, you know, how dare you say that the New Testament is a collection of heretical writings? Well, we'll see. But in the meantime, let's see what else Paperboy has to present where, which he thinks is going to help his case. In Genesis, about when God appeared to Abraham, it says, Then the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre in the heat of the day, while he was sitting up at the entrance of his tent. And Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. And then we see that the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham and Abraham returned to his place. So clearly we see in Genesis 19.1 that the two angels that came to Sodom and Gomorrah in the evening and Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. So we see the angels went to Sodom and Gomorrah but the Lord went elsewhere. But then when we get to Genesis 19.24 it says, then the Lord, and I'll use the anglicised, word of Jehovah rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Jehovah out of heaven so clearly we see Jehovah in two locations and then we jump to Amos 4 11 where it says I overthrew some of you as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and you were as a brand plucked out of the burning yet you did not return to me declares the Lord so this is in correlation to Genesis 19 24 and what's surprising is that we see God saying he has a God. So when Muslims say, oh, but Jesus prayed to God, how can God have a God? We clearly see God referring to another distinct person who is calling God, or here is Elohim. Elohim can be used as a title of respect. How would this get into Old Testament? Seems very odd. No, it's not odd, because before you did this presentation, this happened. Well, no, this this, uh, this, this translates it from the Lord. You should, you, should so, use a, you should use a better translation. This, this is from Safari. It's uh, from... They, but you should use... You should, the uh, the Chabad's got a much better translation with Rashi on it. It does it a lot better. But it, it, what it's saying here is, Mi'et Hashem is from the cause... Right. God caused the, 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 the fire to rain down from heaven. heaven. So there was... So the, God is named twice in this yeah. verse. Yeah. So it's showing God's in two locations. Why? Because it's saying the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah fire and brimstone from the Lord that was in heaven. No, what it's saying is that it's a miracle. It says God caused yes caused this to rain down from heaven. Yes. And it wouldn't happen in a natural but way. Where does it say from? What? It says from. No, the, it's, but that's what I'm saying. It's Me'et Hashem doesn't mean it from a location. It means that God caused it. Okay. It means this came by the command of God. <laughs> God rained it down, and this came, it came through a command of God. Mm -hmm. okay. to it's going to be the last question. That's right. it. That's okay. it. So despite this, Paperboy still goes ahead and tells us that God is in two locations, according to Genesis 19.24 and Amos 4.11. And that is the problem. If he read Alan Siegel's book, he would know that that's not the case. Because Alan says, felt the repetition meant that the divine punishment was carried out by the angel Gabriel. Thus, he must have believed that one of the Yahwehs in that passage refers to Gabriel. Now, that's what Alan says. But what does Rashi say, according to what Rabbi Abrahamson re recommended to read? Well, he says this, from the Lord. This is the scriptural way of speaking. And he gives a few examples and he concludes, so also here, from the Lord, and he did not say from him. And then he goes on, from heaven, when God is about to punish mankind, he brings upon them fire from heaven, just as he did to Sodom. And when he caused the manna to fall, it was also from heaven. 
as it, as it is said in Exodus 16:4, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Now, let's just quickly backtrack and look at what the sources say about Genesis 18, 2 and 19, 1. According to the Palestinian Targum by Jonathan ben Uzel, Genesis 18, 2 says, And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three angels in the, res in the resemblance of men were standing before him. Angels who had been sent from the necessity of three things, because it is not possible for a ministering angel to be sent for more than one purpose. Now Rashi says the same thing, and behold three men, one to announce to Sarah the birth of a son, one to overthrow Sodom, and one to cure Abraham, for one angel does not carry out two commissions. And he references Genesis Rabbah. So let's have a look at that. It, it was taught, one angel does not carry out two commissions, and two angels do not carry out one commission. Rather, Michael said his tidings and departed, Gabriel was sent to overthrow Sodom and Raphael to rescue Lot. So now we have a contradiction. The sources say that there were three angels and then we have people who are saying, well, in Genesis 19, 24, God has a God. No. According to Alan Siegel, according to the sources, the second Yahweh is Gabriel. So you have a father and you have that caused fire and brimstone to rain down from heaven and Gabriel is the one that overthrew Sodom. I'm confused. What is he trying to do? Defend Christianity? Or ruin it? Anyway, let's give him another chance. So now, we have clearly in the Ten Commandments, you shall not have any other gods before me. So God is obviously clearly, clearly telling the Israelites that they should not worship anything other than him. So then we have to ask ourselves, why was the Shema revealed? Because it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, is God just repeating himself? Or does God know that when he gave Moses the Torah, Moses wrote about two Jehovah's? And people might get confused thinking, hold on, in the Ten Commandments it says, you shall have no other God before me. But then we're seeing two Jehovah's. So is God saying that these two Jehovah's that you're seeing are one? To stop the confusion, so people do not go fall into po polytheism. So this is where it all begins, the concept of God being one. And the word used here is Ahad. And we clearly see the word Ahad can mean a, uh, a unit of one or a compound one, not a singular one, which some people try and say. So this is why I wanted to go into what Siegel has said in his book, because it's clear that Paperboy has not read the book. He's ignored the exegesis by the rabbi. He hasn't given us any exegesis of the passages he's quoted and therefore he has come to this sort of some sort of conclusion that God has a God in Genesis 1924 despite the evidence uh, and that has led him further to go and say well Echad in the Shema means a compound one well let's clear that up now this is pulled from the Strong's Concordance based on Deuteronomy 6.4 uh, where it shows that Echad is a number it's a singular one, not a compound one, as he said. Now, Yachad, on the other hand, is a compound one. And we have examples from the Old Testament, uh, Deuteronomy 33.5, Hosea 8.11.8, 8, and Psalm 133 verse 1. Now, here's a fun fact. Hosea 11.9 states, for I am God and not a man. Now, I hear what you're saying. You're going to say, well, he's saying this because he's not going to... Uh, go back on his word, he will not devastate um, Ephraim, he will not uh, show his anger, and he's the Holy One. But you have to ask yourself, why is God emphasizing that he is not a man? I mean, he could have said all of this without saying that he's not a man. He could have just said, I am God and I will not devastate Ephraim. Why is he emphasizing this? Food for thought. And just to drive the point home even further, on page 33 of Siegel's book, it says, they may have been describing a trinity of sorts in relation to Genesis 1 1 and 1 26 in chapter 8. As some scholars have suggested, but whether of the Gnostic or Christian variety is difficult to decide. However, the Greek translation of these passages implies two rather than three powers. So, why did I skip 
right back to Genesis 1 1. Well, to show that even if we go right to the beginning, this idea shows it at best two powers, and it, even then it's a heresy. Um, so, where's this Trinity that he's supposed to be telling us is a Jewish concept? I haven't seen it yet. Have you? And also in the Jewish Encyclopedia under the heading of God by Emil G. Hirsch, it shows us that anthropomorphism, anthropomorphisms are avoided in the Targum. There are no such things as hypostasis and that God is above anything with human similitude. So us as Muslims have every right to ask, how can God have a God? And if you try and give us Genesis 1924 or Genesis 1 uh, and whatnot to say, well, here you go, there's the Trinity. All we have to do is say, stop spinning Jewish texts. So to sum up this section before we move on, according to Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 2, there's a Lord and three men. Now, to Paperboy, it's a Trinity. Despite Genesis 19, 1 saying two of the men were angels. Now, Genesis 18.33 says, the Lord went his way. So who is the Lord? Well, Paperboy then goes on to connect these to say Genesis 19.24 means God has a God, despite the primary and secondary sources disagreeing with him in every single way, whether it's a trinity or the two powers, because it's a repetition and it's a miracle. Now, Genesis Rubber 50, section 2 says, Michael said his tidings and departed. So who's Michael? Well, Michael is the Lord in Genesis 18, 33. So did Moses know he was speaking of two Jehovah's according to Paperboy? Well, of course, Moses knew that this was all repetition and we have the sources to back that up. But even if we ignore everything like Paperboy did, ignore all the criteria, we still have two persons, not three. So where is the Trinity that he's supposed to defend? But we won't ignore it because we will read the sources how they are. So, like I said, Paperboy presents it very well. He did all of this, calm, collected, confident, but it's all wrong. Uh, so I have to ask you guys, is this someone you want to take knowledge from? Is this the person that has done some serious scholarship? The guy that has done thorough research? I don't think so. Now I could end it here, but I said I was going to refute the whole thing. So let's move on. The Targum were originally spoken translation of Jewish scriptures that the Megatermin would give to in the common language to the listeners that was not Hebrew. So this is a text that was in Aramaic. And because in the first century, Jewish people did not speak Hebrew. So they had to then translate it into uh, Aramaic, or it was an Aramaic uh, kind of paraphrasing of the Hebrew Bible. And we see Jews will say, this is accepted within Judaism and it goes back to the prophets. And the people who wrote it, like Jonathan Ben Uzel, were inspired people, inspired sages. Okay, so now we know what the Targums are. They're an Aramaic paraphrase of the Hebrew Bible. But that's not the reason I played the clip. I played the clip so you can hear from Paperboy himself where he says that the sages were inspired people and that the Targums can be traceable to the prophets. Now, Paperboy, you would have not said this statement if you didn't believe it would help your case. So now I know that anything you present, you will present under the notion that it is inspired and traceable to the prophets. And because of that, it will prove to be your further downfall. Let's have a look. So now what we see that's interested in here is that concept of the memory of the Lord. And it says, this is from the Jewish Encyclopedia, the word in the sense of the creative or directive word or speech of God manifesting his power in the world of matter or mind. A term used especially in the Targum as a substitute for the Lord when an anthropomorphic expression is to be avoided. So it says in the Targum, the memory figures constantly as the manifestation of the divine power or as God's messenger in place of God himself. Whenever the predicative is not in conformity with the dignity of the spirit or the deity. And it says like the Shekinah, the manifestation of God near to God and sits on his throne receiving the prayers of Israel. Now the problem we have is this is within the Jewish encyclopedia and it says the memory sits on God's throne and receives prayers. Now this would be 
what Muslims call sh shirk or polytheism because how can something other than God sit on his throne and receive prayers but this is clearly where we start seeing why John was using the saying uh, Jesus was the word because the memra was something seen in traditional Judaism as something that sat on God's throne and received prayers and we'll look at some of the verses and how they translate it no we will see how you think they use it now before we move on I want to address a few a few things he said now he said that John knew this concept of the memra he knew it was Jesus this is why he used it in his gospel and he's saying that the memra who is apparently Jesus sat on God's throne and received prayers well let's quickly debunk that Okay, so the first issue is with his quote from the Jewish Encyclopedia because he misunderstood it. It says, a term used especially in the Targum as a substitute for the Lord to avoid an anthropomorphic expression. So this is not talking about a second person, it's talking about the same God having a different term being used just to avoid anthropomorphism. Now, if we go back again to Siegel's work, on pages 120, 182 through to 183, we see that Philo, who is a Hellenized Jewish philosopher, saw the Logos as an angel. Now, remember when Paperboy said that the sages were inspired people? Well, let's have a look at the sage Onkelos and what he says about the memoir. In his Targum, in relation to Genesis 15:1, he says, after these th things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in prophecy, saying, Fear not, Abram, my word shall be thy strength and thy exceeding great reward. Now, I came across an academic paper that talks about this, and it says the following. Onkelos Genesis 15 suggests that the memorer was God's agent to communicate the covenant to Abraham and to mediate the covenant sign. In each of these cases, the memra carries out a role beyond verbal speech or declaration from God. In fact, the memra functions as God's agent in the Targums by doing the work that the Hebrew Bible ascribes to God. And this is in the academic paper, The Meaning of the Memra, Shekinah and Yakara, and their theological use in the New Testament in chapter 2, pages 39 through to 40. Now, let's just quickly ignore this part about Neophyte Genesis 1-2 because this will come up soon anyway. So did John know why he used the term Logos? Because as we have seen so far, the Logos doesn't necessarily mean Jesus. It could mean God's agent and it could mean an angel. And both, you know, aren't contradictory. So does the Memra sit on God's throne? Is it Jesus who sits on God's throne? Well, let's have a look. A Christian pastor called Eric Chang wrote a book called The Only True God. Now, in chapter 8, uh, which is called The Word is the Memra, on page 479, he says, The member brings Israel nigh unto God and sits on his throne receiving the prayers of Israel. And this is according to the Targum, which Paperboy did reference. This kind of meditorial language could give the impression that the memra is an actual person, but when one looks at the second part of the verse, the memra sits on his throne receiving the prayers of Israel, one realizes that to the monotheistic Jew, only God can sit on God's throne, and to him alone Israel prayed. So the first part of the verse means God's word brings Israel near to God, moreover, only Yahweh is mentioned in Deuteronomy 4, 7. So this goes back to the Jewish Encyclopedia, where it says that the term Memra is used as a substitute. Not because it's a second person, it's because it's just a substitutory term for God. And it's only God that sits on the throne. Now, to a monotheistic Jew, who is God? Well, it's the Father, as Jesus says in John 4. So I don't know what Paperboy is getting at. I believe he is I believe he is being ignorant of the sources and he's refusing to read the sources. And we have seen in one case where he lied about the sources. Okay, well this is the end of part one. Uh, thank you for watching. I hope to bring part two out uh, at some point next week. Um, don't at me when it is. Um, if you have any questions about this presentation, please contact me on Twitter. Um, my DMs are open. Uh, but before I close, I just want to say 
if you watched his video and you believe that he done thorough research, I, I don't blame you. You know, we are all ignorant to a degree. But when does our ignorance become shameful? It's when we refuse to do anything about it. Now, my sources have all been cited in this part, and they will continue to be cited. Uh, please do not take my word for it. I am not a scholar. I am not a person of authority. Take this. Go away. Read on it. Contact me if you want to know where I get the material from. And uh, hopefully we will all come to know the truth that there is only one God worthy of worship. See you in part two. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ooh. Mm -hmm.